Zach. Writing an embellished account like that surprised me a bit.、Uh, I, I never fashioned myself as an author, and I thought I was a one-and-done author, quite frankly. Then the 2016 election came along, and whatever your politics are, I began to wonder whether、uh, a self-professed bigot could become president of the United States. There we go. Recording. Hey, readers and writers. Today I'm joined by Mark Bello. Mark is an attorney and the author of the Zachary Blake legal thriller series. Mark, hello. Welcome to Read and Write. Hi. Thank you. Nice to be here. So, when we chatted earlier, you said your favorite novel was To Kill a Mockingbird, and I'm curious, like, why? What draws you to the story? Well, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I said it was my favorite novel. It's my certainly my favorite legal novel. Okay,、um, I stand corrected. <laughs> it, it might be my favorite novel. I, I, I really haven't thought about novels <laughs> in terms of of favorites or not favorites. But what、mm-hmm. I what I loved about Mockingbird is the bravery of the lawyer. You're、okay. looking at you're looking at a time when representing a black person in America, in the South, was not something、mm-hmm. that that any、uh, anybody faint of heart would have done, and、sure. Atticus Finch did it without hesitation, and did it as well as anybody、uh, back then could have done it.、Mm-hmm. Um, the concept of The brave lawyer taking on the ills of society、uh, st- strikes a chord with me. Obviously, it's it's what I、right. spent my career doing, but、mm-hmm. <laughs> but not as bravely as as Atticus <laughs> Finch.、Um, his family was threatened, his life was、mm-hmm. threatened.、Uh, he was considered a pariah to anybody in the community, besides the black community.、Um, He recognized injustice when he saw it, and、mm-hmm. and called it out.、Uh, okay. You'll recall that、uh, that Tom was tried by an all-white jury, which probably wouldn't happen today. Or so all or maybe those, it would. All, people just yell about it. All of those things、uh, in in the context of the times. Uh, were very inspiring to me, both as a young student reading the novel for the first time, as、mm-hmm. a as a law student, as a lawyer,、um, going into the civil and criminal justice system, and then later in life as an author.、Uh, I I wanted Zachary Blake to take on the kinds of causes and the kinds of cases. That、uh, Atticus Finch might have in modern、nice. times.、Mm-hmm. That's admirable.、Um, you said as a young child or as a young student,、um, I believe you said.、Uh, so, do you think this influenced your choice of career in the law? I think, I, yeah, I, I definitely think so.、Uh, the the brave lawyer again、mm-hmm. taking on injustice in America. Right is an inspiring thing for a young for a young guy, and I, I, you know, in in my small way, I don't I don't consider myself、um, in the category of Harper Lee, uh, uh, but in my small way, I hope my novels inspire、uh, young students slash law students slash lawyers、mm-hmm. to take on those kinds of cases. That may not be sexy, but、uh, are important. Now, did you always want to write a novel, or was that something that came later in life? Definitely later in life. It's it's a, it's almost like a second career. Back in the nineteen eighties, 
-hmm. I handled what I consider the case of my career. Mm -hmm. It was a uh, clergy abuse case. Two boys had been molested by a priest. The church, uh, both uh, the national church and the local and state uh, divisions of the church, Mm -hmm. were covering up the crimes, uh, at least the prior crimes. His current, the crime that that he committed against uh, my clients, um, he served time for. Not enough time. That's good. (laughs) And not the crime that he committed. Uh, It was a much lesser uh, offense. Mm -hmm. Um, But it it felt to me like uh, there was a clandestine organization uh, whose job it was to cover up these things and make them go away as quietly as possible. Uh So when I decided to write a book, uh, after I retired from practicing law in my 60s, I'm going to be 70 next month. Oh, congratulations. Um, (laughs) Thank you. Um, I decided to write it as a fictional account rather than a nonfiction account. Okay. Uh, And it gave me the license to create the coalition, which is a clandestine organization within the church whose job it is to silence witnesses, to transfer priests, to do things to keep these things from uh, Mm -hmm. the public awareness. Um, And that's what Betrayal of Faith uh, is about. It is a highly fictionalized account of a real event. Okay. Um, how do you think that writing and publishing novels since Betrayal of Faith, how does that change the way you see yourself? Or does it? I don't take myself too seriously. <laughs> uh, I, 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 have, uh, I don't have much of an ego. Uh, so I guess I get the, the way I would answer that is I surprised myself. I, I, okay. I always wanted to write Betrayal of Faith. It mm-hmm. was a bucket list item. I thought I could do it. It was about a, a, an experience that I had. Um, the way I wrote it was kind of like Spotlight, the movie, uh, versus The Firm, where mm-hmm. where you have kind of a mafia-type organization right. uh, quieting these events of clergy abuse uh, so the public does not become outraged um, mm-hmm. and writing an embellished account like that surprised me a bit. Um, I, I never fashioned myself as an author and I thought I was a one and done author, quite frankly. Mm-hmm. Then the 2016 election came along mm-hmm. and whatever your politics are, I began to wonder whether uh, a self-professed bigot could become president of the United States. Mm-hmm. Uh, a, a certain candidate had argued that he would deport all Muslims. He would prevent immigration from Mexico and South America. And uh, to me, that's a slippery slope. Mm-hmm. So I wrote a book in four months about a big wow. president who um, decided to do exactly what Donald Trump threatened to do. Mm-hmm. And when I released the book called Betrayal of Justice, um, I got accused of doing a hit job on the man who was now president. And my response okay. was, I wrote the book before he became president. If you see a mm-hmm. similarity between the two, that's on him, not on me. Right. <laughs> my guy yeah, was just first. coincidence. Your brain made it up. <laughs> uh, now, having said that... I, I it was certainly based on the rhetoric that he mm-hmm. uh, was using during the campaign. I was hoping that he'd be a different kind of guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, th- I was hoping it was campaign rhetoric, not, and it would not right. transfer over to the presidency. To my dismay, it did. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I, fans of Donald Trump will not be fans of betrayal of justice, that's for sure. Okay. Uh, once I wrote that book, once I took a topic from the news and turned it into a novel. 
it became uh, it, not, not obvious to me, but it became uh, more sensible to me that I could do this, that I could write novels from topical headline. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's what I've been doing ever since. Um, how many how many books are in your series right now as of t- I, as of today? I'm just about to release my eighth. Okay, having, nice. Having a, little, having a little trouble with the Amazon platform and and uh, formatting the book. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had a I had a rather important publicity assistant who left me, and I'm I'm stuck doing all this stuff myself all of a sudden. <laughs> so right. it's uh, it's been a little difficult, but but the book should be released for Easter. It's called. Oh, nice. It's called "You Have the Right to Remain Silent." Okay, so you're you're breaking away from the betrayal of the first. It's title the first series. time I've done it, but it, the title fits the mm-hmm. um, the content. content of the novel. Um, I'm super curious now. I'm going off my own script. Um, you said you wrote "Betrayal of Justice" in three months, which is amazing. Um, how long, on average, has it taken you to write the other ones? It it's varied. Um, you've I've, I'm sure you've heard authors say, you know, when the juices flow, they flow, and when they mm-hmm. don't, they don't. Right. I haven't had much of a problem with what's known as writer's block. Uh, Lucky I've been you. able I've been <laughs> able to complete uh, books by outlining them uh, mm-hmm. by by um getting an idea plotting it on paper and then sitting in front of a computer and and turning it into mm-hmm. a novel um betrayal of faith was written over probably a 20 year period but i was engaged in the full time practice of law at the time right uh, as a retiree Pulling topics like school shootings and cop on black, Black Lives Matter type incidents, Mm -hmm. Um, a Supreme Court justice who commits a sexual assault in his youth, Uh, you can see that these topics are coming directly Mm -hmm. from the news Um, and uh, they have, I I don't want to say they're easy to write because Writing a novel, yeah, I don't think any book is easy. Uh, it's not something everybody, yeah, it's not something everybody does, mm-hmm. or anybody, or everybody can do. But for me, uh, once I choose a topic and plot out uh, the novel, I can write it in, I would say, four months to a year. Okay, um, that leads me to another off-brand question here. Um, what's your writing day look like? What's your routine? Are you spending most of your day writing the novel, or do you do it only for an hour or two or something like that? The If I'm writing a novel, mm-hmm. which I'm not always Yeah, the, write, always the writing doing, portion of the novel, um, yes. I will write most, many hours in a day. Okay. Uh, Usually every day, okay. if, the ju- if the juices are flowing. Mm-hmm. Um, if I'm between novels, I spend most of my time trying to market my novels, mm-hmm. whether it be appearing on a show like yours, um, if I'm um, invited, <laughs> um, or you know, finding various publicity opportunities mm-hmm. uh, to get my work out whether that's whether that's simply going on Facebook or on LinkedIn mm-hmm. or what have you on my own uh, so a lot of my time is spent doing that and I'm retired so I enjoy my leisure time and I like to play tennis and golf and things like that and mm-hmm. I spend some of my time doing things like that and as I told you off air I have nine grandchildren <laughs> and I love Keeps spending busy. time with my grandchildren Mm -hmm. it's 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 a it's been an interesting mix of enjoying myself but uh also enjoying my writing career i never like i said i never expected uh 
to write one novel, let alone eight. Right. I, I've branched out and, and wrote a children's book, which is about nice. to be released. Um, do I have it here? Yeah. Have you, um, have you guinea pigged this on your grandchildren? Yeah, I, I actually, actually I have. Happy Jack, Happy Jack Sad, Sad, Jack. Sad Jack. It's, um, it's a book about, uh, a biracial kid who was bullied on his first day at kindergarten oh, no. because he's a little different than the mm-hmm. other children. Um, I also wrote a Jewish cookbook, <laughs> <laughs> which is kind of interesting. I don't mean to turn away from you, but I happen to have that one here too. Um, now this, it, it, it's kind of cute. If you look at the bottom, it's mm-hmm. written by Zachary Blake. My my uh, <laughs> written by Zachary they're, they're, Blake as told to Mark Bellow. Right. Now what this book is, um in reality, you'll see it's called the Blake Lewin Family Cookbook of Traditional mm-hmm. Jewish Recipes. Lador uh-huh. Vador from Generation to Generation Two. Lador Vador means from generation to generation in Hebrew. Mm-hmm. I wrote a uh, prequel, uh, Lador Vador One, okay. which is about Zachary's grandfather's escape from Auschwitz. It's a little 40-page novella that basically okay. tells the reader what inspired Zach to become uh, mm-hmm. a lawyer, um, which is not to kill a mockingbird, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the injustice that was done during World War II was was his was his inspiration to become mm-hmm. uh, the lawyer he eventually became. Um, but my real family, my mother's family, mm-hmm. has a family club, and the family club is seventy five years old. Now it's eighty years old, mm-hmm. uh, but they had a seventy fifth anniversary, and they wrote this cookbook. Uh, of recipes from, uh, my God, it, it, it might be now 120 years. The oldest recipe might be 120 years old or so. Wow, that's amazing. So I, so I wrote a uh, fun little uh, cookbook incorporating these recipes and others mm-hmm. uh, from traditional conservative Jewish life and using my, uh, putting on my author hat rather than just regurgitating recipes, mm-hmm. I, I create funny little anecdotes for each character and my experience as Zachary Blake engaging with that particular family member. Interesting. So it has it has some fun little stuff in it. Mm-hmm. Some of the stories and some of the people are my actual relatives and my actual encounters with that relative. Oh, very nice. Not, I won't tell you which, but... Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I, I, I'll tell you one. <laughs> I, I, sh- I, I tell a story in the, in, the, in the book about my Aunt Nettie, or mm-hmm. Zachary's, Zachary's Aunt Nettie, Mm-hmm. Uh, washing his mouth out with soap. Um, the actual person who got his mouth out, washed out with soap by Aunt Nettie was not Zachary Blake. I, 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 will, <laughs> I will candidly share that with you. Um, he starts to tell the story in the uh, in the cookbook mm-hmm. so that the readers can understand why he got his mouth washed out with soap. And his wife, Jennifer, who is a character in my novels, She's the uh, mother of the children in, in the first novel, Betrayal of Faith. Okay. Her and, her and Zachary, uh, if you're a reader of Zachary Blake novels, you'll know that they eventually got together and got married. Okay. But, but um, Jennifer cuts him off and, tells him, and says, you can't tell that story uh, <laughs> to, to, re- to, reader, to readers of a, of a family book. So, so uh, it's like it, it was fun and mm-hmm. it's a it's a fun little tribute to my family 
Nice. Um, I think you actually answered my next question. I was going to ask about your body of work um, because I knew that they all had the Zachary Blake as the main character, but I wasn't sure if they were connected. Like if there was any overarching story types, then I think you actually just answered that at least a little bit in regards to the wife. Are you asking me, do I, is, there, is there a correlation between Zachary and me? Or- no, I was saying over the course of those eight novels, like I was asking, like, is there an overarching uh, plot line that uh, connects them all? That connects them all. The in the first book, uh, Zach is a borderline alcoholic, mm-hmm. down and out, burned out, um, divorced. Wife took the kids. <laughs> Partners broke up with him. He was oh no, uh, he was he having was, a hard uh, time. He was having a hard time, and he gets a phone call from Jennifer Tracy, the mother of these two children, mm-hmm. and um, I don't want to ruin the novel, but mm-hmm. uh, she basically inspires him to clean up his act, nice. and. Uh, their relationship uh, continues throughout the series. Mm -hmm. Uh, Zachary's relationship with his investigator, Michael Love, who's a fun character, Mm -hmm. uh, continues and blossoms throughout the the novels. Mm -hmm. And and back and forth, uh, certain characters uh, go away and reappear throughout the series. So but it's like a living, big, breathing world. Well, the biggest thing about the novels is that a new client emerges in each of these novels. Mm-hmm. Uh, for some reason or other, by the way, and, and others have discussed this with me, because it was not intentional, but they seem to be female, and okay. they seem to be they seem to be strong female protagonist clients. Okay. Uh, and I've kind of made a subspecialty of introducing uh, the female client. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I've been some, some people have liked them. Some people have said I've made uh, this person too dependent on Zach or that person mm-hmm. too weak or meek. Mm. Uh, Everybody's I, I got their own opinion about yeah, this. Yeah, without question. And others have said, you know, wow. These are such, these are some strong women. Mm-hmm. Um, this latest novel, I did a kind of unique thing. I took a real character, a real mm-hmm. person, by the name of Sherry Bellitz, who was a jury mm-hmm. consultant in New York, and okay. I made her a jury consultant in "You Have a Right to Remain Silent." And her okay. and Zach, her and Zach, uh, worked together to try and. Uh, exonerate uh, a uh, conservative talk show host who was accused of killing her progressive congressman husband. Mm-hmm. Um, Interesting. How did that work? Did you get her permission to use um, her name and I assume likeness as well? Yes, her and I. Her and I had uh, uh, met on LinkedIn. Mm-hmm. So here's a plug for LinkedIn, <laughs> <laughs> and we had several conversations on LinkedIn, and I. Had this idea for the novel. I ran it by her and I said, you know, rather than create uh, a fictional jury consultant, what do you think of the idea of uh, using you and your service um, and interacting you with a fictional lawyer? Mm-hmm. How uh, did she feel about she that? She loved the idea. She's very, she's very excited about it. <laughs> and uh, she can't wait to read it. So. so um, but she's a now, real did she person. Get an, did she get an advanced copy, or does she get an advanced copy when uh, well, it's time? She, keep, she keeps asking for one. I haven't. I haven't <laughs> given her one yet. She contributed uh, pieces uh-huh. of the book. I, I, I wasn't. You know, lawyers. A lot of a lot of uh, non-lawyers think that lawyers. If if you have the title lawyer, mm-hmm. you must know everything about the law. And okay, I could see that. Uh, lawyers are typically specialists. Mm-hmm. There are very few uh, 
um, lawyers who practice in multiple specialties these days. Back mm-hmm. in the old days, where you know the the uh, town lawyer had an office downtown, and you know everybody ran in and had them do this, that, or the other thing. Not mm-hmm. that that doesn't exist today, but not not in a specialized way. Right. Um, the same lawyer will not handle your divorce, who does your will, who handles mm-hmm. your personal injury case, uh, who um, right. Uh, it's like a your drunk like driving a, uh, uh, case or a criminal case. Mm-hmm. Uh, you'll usually have a different lawyer for each one of those things. Mm-hmm. So the point I'm making is that that in my practice, uh, I did personal injury work when I practiced law. Mm-hmm. Uh, that type of case might have might have um, prompted me to use a jury consultant. I just never did. Right. So I knew nothing about uh, jury consulting other than perhaps watching uh, the Bull television series or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, when I found her online, and I had this idea of a conservative female talk show host being accused of murdering her liberal congressman husband, mm-hmm. I thought this is this would be an interesting little twist if a jury consultant got involved in uh, helping Zachary uh, pick uh, the jury of his choice, if you will. You can, you, uh-huh. If you know anything about jury selection, it's a hard process, and you can never get the quote jury of your choice. Mm-hmm. But you can try to come as close as you want as you can. Mm-hmm. Um, I made the point about Atticus Finch and his all white jury. That certainly mm-hmm. wasn't the <laughs> the jury he wanted Tom Robinson uh, tried in front of. Right. Um, so you can't always get what you want in in uh in selecting a jury and mm-hmm. you can't always select your own jury more and mm-hmm. more uh judges are taking the voir dire process uh the jury selection process away from lawyers um so it's difficult to uh, select a jury these days but uh-huh sherry uh specializes in that she has both a law degree and a degree in psychology, if I recall correctly. Mm-hmm. And um, she has quite a personality, so it was fun to turn her into a, a fictionalized version of herself. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, brash, sassy, sexy, um, a Joan Rivers type, smart ass mouth. Okay, uh, and she she's. She's quite enamored with the character I created, <laughs> and, it's, and it's not it's not that far from her. Uh, uh-huh. uh, she was she's, if I understood her correctly, and I don't want to speak for her, but she was very pleased with the result. Nice. Um, one more question on this topic because I'm I'm extremely curious about it. Did you go searching for a juror selection person to help with the novel, or did you just was this just happenstance and just like, hey, this works with what I'm doing? No, I, I, it was a surprise to me. I, I had this idea to write mm-hmm. this novel. Right. It was going to be uh, a traditional jury trial type novel. Mm-hmm. Uh, a person accused of murder being defended by Zachary Blake as mm-hmm. uh, Arya Khan, a Muslim woman, uh, was accused of murdering a white supremacist in betrayal of justice. Mm -hmm. Um, And the whole Muslim white supremacy um, conflict in betrayal of justice was part of what Donald Trump and his rhetoric inspired in me when I wrote that novel. Mm -hmm. Um, In this case, I'm playing, for lack of a better way to say it, online, uh, and um, 
I have my own podcast, by the way, called Justice Counts, and nice. I had Sh- and I had Sherry on as a guest. Okay. Because I want. All right. I'm, I wanted, I'm starting to. See, yeah, I'm starting to see the lines here. I wanted to learn uh, about jury consulting, and you mm-hmm. know, the bells started to ring in my head. Mm-hmm. What if Zachary uh, handles this case with the help of a strong female protagonist um and again i it isn't intentional it just seems to, i just seem to migrate to either female clients or female tag team partners mm-hmm. uh, jennifer tracy in the first book arya khan the the muslim woman falsely accused in the second book mm-hmm. um uh, haley larson the uh, young woman who was sexually assaulted by a Supreme Court justice in Supreme Betrayal. Mm-hmm. That is the sixth book. Um, Sarah Hayes is the widow of a black man shot by a white cop in Betrayal in Black, the fourth book. Mm-hmm. Um, so the clients tend to be female. Not all of them, but mm-hmm. I would say four out of Four, five. I don't. Know. I've written eight now, so I. Uh, <laughs> but the, and in this particular book, if you count the client who was a um, prominent broadcaster, uh, mm-hmm. conservative broadcaster, along with Sherry, who was a um, jury consultant who owns her own business. I I have tended to depict um, and use strong women in my novels. Mm-hmm. Now you say you were plucking these stories like from the news, like that. That's kind of that. That's you. That's what gives you the inspiration for the next novel. Um, when you're doing this, what do you think comes first, the characters or the actual plot line? Like, are you imagining someone? in the role of this or is it the the plot line of the novel that comes to you first and you attach a character to it in, in terms of well the answer to your question is is plot first okay uh when when the Kavanaugh situation happened with Christine Blasey Ford and Brett Kavanaugh um whether you believe Christine Blasey Ford or not, um, or if you believe Christine Blasey Ford, let's put mm-hmm. it that way, uh, that is not a person you want on the United States Supreme Court. Mm-hmm. I don't know whether Christine Blasey Ford is remembering an actual situation that she had with Brett Kemp, and I have no reason to disbelieve her. On the mm-hmm. other hand, he testified under oath that it didn't happen. Mm-hmm. Um, I have no reason to disbelieve him either. And we don't know who was telling the truth and who was not. Mm-hmm. The, Me, the Me Too movement is suggesting that uh, we believe the woman. And I must say, um, I have some quarrels with that. I believe the purpose of a court of law is to determine whether or not this person is telling the truth or that person Mm -hmm. is telling the truth and, and allowing a judge or a jury to decide that Mm -hmm. the media uh, and the me too movement are suggesting that the woman be believed. I'm not criticizing that other than it's not my world. My world is prove that in a court of law. Right. Um, But what I did do is I created a character in Supreme Betrayal who was clearly guilty, clearly evil, Mm -hmm. far more evil than Brett Kavanaugh, even if he's guilty. Mm -hmm. Uh, This is the man who would murder somebody to silence them. Okay. And, and, bad guy. and, And he is a candidate for the highest court in the land. Mm-hmm. So, while it was inspired by 
the Kavanaugh hearings. Mm -hmm. uh, Oliver Wilkinson, the judge in my book, is not Brett Kavanaugh. And those who would suggest, as they did in Betrayal of Justice, that I did a hit job on Kavanaugh, uh, would be incorrect. Mm -hmm. was, I, was I inspired by the incident? Yes. Did right. I write a book about Brett Kavanaugh? Absolutely not. Right. Um, but a young woman taking on a Supreme Court judicial candidate um, with a brave lawyer by her side, that's hard to do, even if you have the so-called king of justice as your lawyer. Um, <laughs> and, and she was very brave, and I tried to portray her that way. Okay. I, I, and I want and I wanted to demonstrate how difficult it is for a woman like that to challenge someone who is uh, well known mm -hmm. and well thought of in a public forum like right. a Senate a Senate hearing who has her own husband and her own children and essentially stops life as she knows it. Uh, to take this on. Uh, it's a very brave thing to do. And it's a, without pounding myself, I'm, you know, beating my chest, it's mm -hmm. a pretty compelling, compelling look at, at uh, someone who does something like that. Okay. Um, since you do draw so heavily on current events, um, how much research do you put into them before you start writing? Before I start writing. Or I guess plotting, I guess, before you begin the, before <laughs> I, you begin the story, however you do define a, that I, beginning. I do a lot of research. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, don't, I don't know how to quantify uh, the amount of research I do, but I do a lot. Having said that, writing fiction um, prevents me from having that research be required to be true. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I'll, I'll compare Supreme Betrayal to the Kavanaugh hearings. Right. Uh, I must have read the transcript of every witness that testified at the Kavanaugh hearings to before I wrote this book. Mm hmm but I didn't regurgitate the Kavanaugh hearings in the book. I I wanted to see Christine Blasey Ford's testimony. I wanted to see Brett Kavanaugh's testimony. Mm -hmm. I wanted to see what the witnesses said about what they remembered. You might re recall that uh, that she said that another gentleman whose name whose name I forget was witnessed the incident. Um, and I then don't he, recall that, but and, yeah. and then he didn't remember it the way she mm -hmm. claimed he should. Uh, so, uh, uh, and and uh, judges uh, came in and and talked about his character and his his ability as a judge and his uh, decision making in 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 certain cases, and all of that uh, was of interest to me. In writing, in writing the book. Mm -hmm. But, as I said earlier, Oliver Wilkinson, my bad guy, uh, was a really, really bad guy. <laughs> and <laughs> and um, I used the research to help me write the book, but it, it, it isn't incorporated that way into the book. I, I don't know if that, that I, I, th I, I, I think I understand what you mean. Yes. <laughs> um, sorry, my brain just whew, went away. Yeah. Um, <laughs> wait, wait, till, wait till you're 70. I, <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> uh, let me just consult my notes here. Uh, yeah, I just, I had it in my head and then I was listening to you and it just, it left somewhere while I was listening to you there. By um, the way, while, while you're recovering, the, the, yes. 
I, I, I answered your question in the context of only one book. Mm -hmm. um, the, the Betrayal in Black was based on the Philando Castile case in Minnesota, mm -hmm. uh, where the, where the girlfriend, um, took her cell phone out and videotaped the murder of her boyfriend in okay. the car. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I did a lot of research about that particular case and the fact situation in Betrayal in Black, uh, kind of mirrors the incident, but the book itself is not at all about the Philando Castile case. So, uh, and I researched a bunch of other um, similar cases before I wrote Betrayal in Black, because obviously, if you look at me, you, you'll you'll readily see that I'm not a black person, and mm -hmm. I have not experienced that kind of discrimination. Although as a Jewish person, I have. Mm -hmm. um, I don't wear it on, on my skin the way a black person does, but I was never shy about telling people uh, that I was Jewish mm -hmm. uh, and found out that that's not always a good thing to do. <laughs> right. Um, so I researched a lot of, of those kinds of incidents, but then wrote a novel, not a, not a nonfiction account right. of those kinds of incidents. Um, and there's a big difference. Uh, sometimes nonfiction can be uh, as compelling as fiction, but it mm -hmm. doesn't. You don't have the the artistic license that you have with fiction. Right. And, and what I want my books to do differently than than uh, real life is talk about how the justice system, whether it be the criminal justice system or the civil justice system can be used, and I and if you don't know the difference between the two, I'm happy to explain, um, but how they can be used to take situations like George Floyd or Philando mm -hmm. Castile and uh, find a way to uh, do justice for uh, either the victim of a, a, a wrong or the survivor mm -hmm. of a victim of the wrong. Yeah. I think it's important to have the issue correct. Maybe you don't necessarily have to cite your sources, but making sure Betray you understand the heart of the issue. One more example. I wrote a book called Betrayal mm -hmm. High, which is about a school shooting. Uh, and I based it on the Parkland, Florida incident. Mm -hmm. where my nephew was a student at the middle school and was in lockdown for six hours. Oh, my God. Uh, as that parents were a nightmare. Was, go was going on. Um, so I did a lot of research on school shootings and, uh, and bullying. Now, bullying is not necessarily linked, quote, unquote, mm -hmm. to school shootings. Um, and I, I'm not suggesting... Uh, that I did, that I researched Parkland to the point where I know that the young man involved in the Parkland shooting was bullied. Mm -hmm. uh, but I decided to link in my book bullying with um, school shooting mm -hmm. for for two reasons. One, I wanted to tell a bullying story, as I did in my children's book. Mm -hmm. Um, and two, I wanted to hold the school and the school system accountable for ignoring it. And mm -hmm. Betrayal High um, is a book about uh, how the school wrongly handled bullying incidents and uh, might be held accountable. Uh, for the consequences of that. And that's what bet Betrayal High is about. Okay. Um, well, I would, one of my final questions here. Um, do you do any interviews in the course of your research uh, of like real victims who have experienced this? Or is it, um, you, are you mostly doing um, just like, a, I, don't know, I don't know, like, like newspaper paper article research? The answer to your question is I've never interviewed a, a person 
who was involved okay. in incidents like the ones I described. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean it's not a good thing to do, mm-hmm. uh, nor that I wouldn't have liked to. Mm-hmm. Uh, having said that, I I just found it. I I don't know. I I think it would be quite an intrusion to contact. I, I can definitely ins- see that angle. For of instance, it. the uh, the young lady that that filmed uh, the Castile uh, murder, for lack of a better mm-hmm. way to say it. Um, I, I don't think the Castile cop was found guilty of of any wrongdoing because Castile had a gun in his car. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't know. I, I I would be very uncomfortable cold call, okay. cold cold calling of the victim of yeah, a crime. Just, fair enough. And I just I was just curious if you had talked yeah, to anyone. It, it's first an interesting thought, though. I just it's just not mm-hmm. something that I that I. Uh, have ever done. I, I don't think it's a bad idea or a bad thing to do. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, any closing thoughts before we um, finish up here? Anything we didn't touch on that you'd like to talk about? Uh, no, just uh, I've got three new books uh, either just released or about to be released. The mm-hmm. cookbook that I showed you, the children's mm-hmm. book, which is going, to, which is the first in a, in a series Oh, I've nice. already written. I've already written two more, but I have to get them illustrated. Right. Um, Are you going to be using the same I'd like illustrator? To to for, I'd like to talk to you about that for a second. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, and the uh, eighth book in the Zachary Blake series, the first one not mm-hmm. to be not to be titled "Betrayal of Something." <laughs> 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 um, what I wanted to tell you about in the with the children's book. I don't know mm-hmm. if you can see it, but it was it's illustrated by Melinda Faugust, who is uh-huh. a who is a talented illustrator. Oh, very nice. And and listeners, I will put this in the show notes that, so you can that's see little pictures. Jack, by the way. Nice. Uh, and his teacher. Um, mm-hmm. The the. She's not only a talented illustrator, but she's a children's book um, author herself. Okay. So um, I just I did want to mention that Melinda uh, okay. illustrated. Will she be books. illustrating the rest of the series? I hope so. Um, I'm working on that. <laughs> All right. Excellent. Um, then um, where can listeners find you and your books online? Uh, my books are available wherever you you find an online bookseller. It could be okay. Apple, it could be Kobo, it could be Amazon, it could be Barnes and Noble. Mm-hmm. Uh, bookstores carry them here and there, but I can't. I don't rely on that. They're self-published, mm-hmm. um, so the best way to find them is online. My website is markmbello.com. Okay. That's M A R K M. B E L L O dot com. And um, if you go to the website, two things you can do. One, you can uh, follow the links for each book and buy them on Amazon because mm-hmm. they're all linked to the Amazon platform. And the okay. other thing is, if you leave your email, you can download the um, Holocaust era novella. Oh, the novella. Nice. The, the Door of the Door One mm-hmm. uh, for free just for leaving an email. Awesome. So that that uh, prequel and the explanation as to what caused Zach to consider the law as a career mm-hmm. uh, is available for free on my website. All right. Wonderful. Well, thank you for taking the time to talk to us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. The Read and Write Podcast is edited and produced by Deborah Zebar. Music was provided by Lo-Fi Girl and can be found at lofigirl.com or on their YouTube channel. Audio effects were created by Red Octopus and Black River Phonogram. Show notes and previous episodes can be found at readandwritepodcast.com.